Hello, this is BBC World News Today. I'm Ben Bland. Our top stories. Six of the 39 people found dead in a truck in the southeast of England may have come from Vietnam. One possible victim sent distressed messages to her brother. Four people are now under arrest. A 48-year-old man from Northern Ireland was arrested at Stansted Airport earlier today on suspicion of conspiracy to traffic people and on suspicion of manslaughter. 21 people die in Iraq as a new wave of protests erupts. We'll have the latest live from the country. Also coming up, a special report on the rise of stalkerware apps on mobile phones. They can expose your messages, GPS location and even see through your camera. Hello and welcome to BBC World News Today. Police in the UK have arrested a fourth person following the discovery of 39 bodies in a lorry east of London on Wednesday. A BBC investigation has discovered several of those who died could be Vietnamese. One family member has described receiving distressing text messages apparently sent from the back of the truck. Ed Thomas has this report. This is Farm Thi Charmi. She's 26 and from Vietnam. Tonight she's missing. Her family fears she was one of the 39 people to lose their life in the refrigerated container found in Essex. At the exact time the container was crossing from Zeebrugge, she sent this disturbing message. I'm really, really sorry, Mum and Dad. My trip to a foreign land has failed. I am dying. I can't breathe. I love you very much. Her brother wanted to broadcast this appeal on the BBC. The BBC has also spoken to the family of Nguyen Ding Luong a 20-year-old man also missing tonight. The Vietnamese embassy in London is now working with UK authorities to identify any victim suspected of being from Vietnam. While the delicate process of private ambulances under police escort remove all 39 bodies from the refrigerated container, post-mortem examinations will be carried out one by one as police try to find out who they were and how they died. What's this noise? The fridge working. Yeah. And that's the sound of the fridge. Yeah, I saw. Wojciech has been transporting refrigerated lorries for two years. Minus 20, minus 21. Temperatures can get as low as minus 25. What's inside it? Uh, I don't know. You don't know. You don't know what's inside. I don't know. Seal here, and I can't open oh. this oh. and check. He's not allowed to break the seal. But every move he makes is followed by a GPS track. Because it's an expensive track and they should know so the where, where I am. Yeah? The trailer has where the is GPS. This track? And we've learned more about the GPS movements of the refrigerated container found in Essex. Sources say tracking GPS data shows the container left Monaghan in Ireland on October the 15th. They made trips to Dublin and Wales before crossing from Dover to Calais on the evening of October the 16th. Once in mainland Europe, it appears the container travelled between Belgium and France, visiting Dunkirk, Bruges and Lille, before it made its final journey from Zeebrugge to Purfleet. Around half an hour later, it had been picked up by a lorry and all 39 bodies discovered inside. For three years, there have been security concerns over Purfleet, Warnings, smuggling gangs were targeting the port. They're dishevelled. Some of them have got boat and they're smart. Janet has lived opposite for more than 35 years. And what's the largest number of people you've seen come off a container? Probably about 30, two dozen at least. This is now an international investigation as police search for the truth and answers for all 39 victims. At Thomas, BBC News, Tilbury Docks. Well, within the last hour, UK police investigating the lorry deaths have given this update. 
We gave an initial steer on Thursday on nationality. However, this is now a developing picture. As such, I will not be drawn on any further detail until formal identification processes approved by Her Majesty's Coroner have taken place. I can confirm we have officers working around the clock and we have now arrested a fourth person. A 48-year-old man from Northern Ireland was arrested at Stansted Airport earlier today on suspicion of conspiracy to traffic people and on suspicion of manslaughter. Let's bring you some of the day's other news now. And human rights groups say 21 people have been killed and many more injured in Iraq after security forces used live rounds and tear gas against anti-government protesters. The unrest is nationwide with mass rallies in the capital Baghdad and the southern cities of Nasiriyah, Diwaniya, Amara and Basra. Protesters are calling it a second wave of demonstrations against corruption and unemployment. Clashes earlier this month left more than 150 people dead. A government report has acknowledged that the authorities used excessive force. Well, Belkis Willie is senior Iraq researcher at Human Rights Watch. She's in Erbil and uh, joins us live now. Um, I, I just wonder what you make of the protests. Do we get a sense uh, that since they began at the start of October, they are intensifying? We had a very intense period of protests for the first nine days of the month from October 1st to 9. And as you said, during those days, we had an extremely large death toll. 149 of those killed were uh, civilians who were protesting. Then uh, things calmed down. There was a quiet period. But during that time, political opponents of the government had been calling on people to take back to the streets today, October 25th because they said that all of the protesters' demands have yet to be met by the government. These are basic demands against corruption and for the most basic services like access to electricity, to water, access to jobs. Uh, that said, uh, Prime Minister Adel Abdul Mahdi's uh, promised a package of reforms, including a cabinet reshuffle and uh, also uh, uh, other reforms to try and meet the protesters' demands. They seem to remain unconvinced by that. Why do you think that is? Unfortunately, historically, since 2003, the Iraqi people have over and over again had governments um, who have made promises to the public that daily life will improve, that services will be consistent, that people will have access to jobs. And unfortunately, until now, none of these governments have lived up to these promises, unfortunately, for one main reason, which is that corruption is so endemic within the Iraqi system. So even though Iraq is one of the richest countries in the world in terms of oil exports, none of that filters to the people. So unfortunately, this time around, they simply don't believe that this government is any more committed to those reforms than previous governments. It sounds like uh, what you're saying or suggesting is that the only thing that will placate the demonstrators is a complete overhaul of the current uh, political class. And that's absolutely what, what many protesters are calling for. They say nothing short of that will give them any conviction that things are going to change. Of course, on the government side, the response is, uh, including from the prime minister in a speech he gave last night, that he does not want to step down because he worries that stepping down, having the cabinet resign, will mean um, basically opening up um, <clears throat> a vacuum in which we, we don't know what, what could happen. It would destabilize the country. But protesters are con continuing and going to continue to go to the streets. And I think the death toll, which we see, we saw not only in the beginning of October, but now today alone, we're hearing, you know, as you said, 21 protesters have been killed. That's going to continue to anger people on the streets and continue uh, to get them out demanding, demanding their rights. OK, Belkis Willey from Human Rights Watch. Thank you very much indeed. Indonesia's air safety watchdog has released its final report on the crash of a Lion Air Boeing 737 MAX a year ago in which 189 people died. The report blames design flaws on the plane and errors from ground staff and crew. Our international business correspondent Theo Leggett reports. It was an appalling accident. A brand new Boeing 737 MAX jet crashed into the sea off Indonesia just minutes after takeoff. 189 people were killed. Now, a year on, investigators have set out in detail what they believe happened. We found nine items that we consider contribute to these accidents. 
They describe a catalogue of failures, a faulty part provided inaccurate information to the flight computer. That made a flight control system malfunction, forcing the nose of the plane down when it was meant to be climbing. The pilots didn't communicate properly and didn't have the skills to keep the plane in the air. Among those who died was Mohammed Rafi, pictured here. Today, his father gave his reaction. It's hard to forget the crash, because my son, Rafi, is the only boy I have in the family. His death can't be compensated by any amount of money. This was not the only tragedy involving the 737 MAX. Just months later, a near-identical plane run by Ethiopian Airlines also crashed, killing 157 people. It's thought that similar issues with the flight control system were to blame. Since then, the aircraft's been grounded worldwide. Learning the lessons from both crashes, we need better communication between the airlines and the, the aircraft manufacturers, between the manufacturers and the regulators, internally within the airlines, and the pilots need to know as well. Boeing says it's already redesigned the controls of the 737 MAX to make it safe. It wants to have it in the air again before the end of the year. But today's report shows that bad design was far from the only problem. Theo Leggett, BBC News. And don't forget you can find more on the Lion Air crash and uh, all of the stories we're covering on our website. Uh, there's uh, a very detailed piece about what went wrong inside the cockpit, the flight path that the plane took and details of who was on board. For all of that, just go to bbc.com news or you can also find it by downloading the BBC News app. The US Justice Department has launched a criminal investigation into the origins of the Mueller inquiry. That's the probe into Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election. The inquiry didn't establish a criminal conspiracy between Russia and the Trump campaign, but did not clear the president of obstructing justice. It was already being reviewed, but the launch of a criminal investigation means investigators can now demand that people give testimony and hand over documents. Chris Buckler joins us live uh, from Washington. Um, Chris, why is an investigation, the Mueller inquiry, now itself being investigated? Well, the, Ben, the original review of the Mueller inquiry was actually put in place because of pressure from the president. But as for the criminal investigation that has now been launched, we simply do not know. We don't understand why it's happening at this stage and exactly what they're looking at. However, the White House has suggested that what they want to do is go back to the original roots of this inquiry that predates even the special counsel, Robert Mueller, and goes back to when the FBI were in charge. And what the White House is suggesting is that they want to try to make sure that there wasn't improper political pressure that started this inquiry from even the Obama administration that saw the Department of Justice and the FBI potentially used for political reasons. Of course, that is firmly denied by many who were in the Obama administration. Uh, that said though, Chris, if it's a criminal investigation, presumably uh, there must be a potential crime that they're looking into. Uh, do we know what that is? We simply have no idea. And in fact, the Department of Justice has not been making comment or telling us exactly what they know or what they are looking at. And that's why Democrats are so angry in all of this. They are pushing the idea that this is actually exactly what the White House has said is being looked into. This idea that the Department of Justice is actually being used now by the president for political reasons, and particularly the US Attorney General Bill Barr. In a statement, they've said that they've got profound Found concerns that William Barr has lost his independence and become a vehicle for President Trump's political revenge. Now, again, those are serious allegations, but it does give you a sense that they feel that what President Trump has long called a witch hunt has now had a witch hunt inquiry launched into that witch hunt inquiry. And uh, Chris, some observers might uh, conclude that this somewhat shifts attention away from the ongoing impeachment inquiry against the president. I think many people will be saying that, and certainly as those inquiries continue, which, remember, are looking into the suggestion that President Trump tried to put pressure on Ukraine into launching an investigation into his political rivals. Those investigations are continuing inside Congress. There's a lot we don't know, but we do know that officials have already suggested that there was improper pressure. They're being held behind closed doors. In fact, earlier this week, we had Republicans storm into one of those sessions. 
But as information drips out of that, the president seems to want to be in a position where he can suggest that he has been the victim of improper political pressure as opposed to the one applying it. OK, Chris, for the moment, thanks very much. Chris Buckler there for us in Washington. Let's have a look now at uh, some of the other main news this hour and protests in Lebanon have now reached their fifth day. Demonstrators cut off major roads on Friday, pledging to keep paralysing the country. That's despite an offer by the president to meet their representatives. The protesters have filled towns and cities across Lebanon, prompting the closure of banks and schools. They're demanding the removal of the entire political class, accusing it of systematic corruption. More than 40,000 people have been evacuated from their homes in California to escape a fast-moving wildfire. The fires are being driven by powerful winds, which are expected to worsen in Southern California over the weekend. The Natural History Museum of London has named a beetle after young climate activist Greta Thunberg. Nella Todis Greti was first collected in Kenya in the 1960s, but has only now been given a name. While the beetle bears little resemblance to the famous climate activist, it does have two long pigtail-like antennae. A Russian serviceman has shot dead eight fellow soldiers and seriously injured two more on a military base in the country's Far East. The shooting happened in the village of Gorny, not far from the city of Chita earlier. BBC Russian service reporter Sergei Goryashko has this update from Russia's capital, Moscow. Belsham Sudin, the private who shot his eight fellow servicemen, was only 20 years old and he has been serving mandatory military service in Russia in uh, the city of Chita. It's in Zabaikalia region in the far east of Russia. He uh, suffered from a mental breakdown or some nervous breakdown as uh, the military department says but actually there are other reports that the cause of the shooting was not the nervous milit or mental breakdown of the soldier but uh, the relationship uh, between the servicemen the so-called dead of Shina or the bullying which actually sometimes occurs among servicemen in Russia happened there and uh, that uh, person that uh, suspect was uh, really too much offended with that. He served for only four months and his dad actually learned the news about the shooting only from the journalists who managed to call him. He says that he hasn't heard anything about it and his son wanted to be a military guy. He wanted to do his military service and he actually wanted to even sign a professional contract after 12 months of service in the city of Gorny. Sergei Galyashko there. Women's charities are concerned by new research that shows a rise in the use of so-called stalkerware apps. The surveillance software allows someone complete access to a victim's phone, showing private messages, GPS locations, even giving someone the ability to see and hear through cameras and microphones. Our cybersecurity reporter, Joe Tidy, reports. Stalkerware or spouseware is powerful surveillance software used to spy on a partner. Once downloaded, it allows someone to see and hear everything a person is doing on or near their phone or computer. According to cybersecurity researchers, stalkerware is a growing problem, particularly for vulnerable women. I've downloaded the software and recruited my colleague Joanne to test it. You're going to use this phone. This is effectively the, we'll call it the perpetrator's phone. Okay. And perp. you're the perp. You've got access to everything I do on this phone. We'll call this phone the victim's phone. So if you look at that phone there, that's your dashboard. So you are all set to effectively spy on me for the next three, three, two days. Joe is buying a whiteboard marker. Oh, okay. And I can hear it. Can you hear it? That is so bizarre. I can see Joe picking up a bike. I can also flip between the front camera and the back camera on Joe's phone. This is quite creepy. Um, I can see where Joe's moving. It's not just updating every so often, it's, it's a live image. 
It's uh, just gone 10 o'clock at night, so I'm gonna try and see his screen now. I think it might be Candy Crush again. I can't just see what he's up to right now, but I can see what he's been doing over the course of the past few hours. There are alerts at the top of the screen uh, for text messages, for social media. So there seems to be a record function where I can go back through all the calls that Joe's made and listen to them. Oh, I'm an idiot. I, uh, I think I haven't really got an excuse. I think I might have been tired or distracted. So Joe, it's fair to say you learned a lot about me through spying. Can I yes. have that back? Yeah, you can take that. Thank you. The amazing thing was for me, obviously knew that you were filming me or listening in or reading my messages, but I had no idea when. Nothing happened, the screen stayed blank unless I was playing with it. No notifications, no battery use, but this data was being sent to you all the time. Victims like Amy, not her real name, say stalkerware is being used as a tool for domestic abuse. There were just little things that were dropped in the conversation that never felt right. He knew details about my friends. I began to wonder how he knew where I was all the time. This is the moment Amy found out the truth by accident. I saw uh, an alert, an email alert that said daily report on my Mac. And I just had this chill go through me. My, I stopped breathing for a minute. That report uh, there by Joe Tidy. New York's Empire State Building is one of the great viewing points over the Big Apple, but it is about to have some more competition with tickets going on sale for a new observation deck in the city. Edge is part of the Hudson Yards development on Manhattan's west side. At 359 metres above street level, it's the highest outdoor observation deck in the Western Hemisphere. The deck's angled panels allow people to lean out against the glass and stare straight down. It will be officially open to the public in March next year. Rising from the desert, the stunning site of Uluru is seen as sacred to the indigenous people of Australia. They've long asked tourists not to climb to the top of the site formerly known as Ayers Rock. And earlier today, it was finally closed to hikers forever. But not before thousands of people queued up for one last climb. From Australia's Northern Territory, our correspondent Phil Mercer reports. Joy, as signs asking visitors not to walk up Uluru are removed. The controversial climb is now officially banned. But earlier today, hundreds of people came down one last time, even though Aboriginal groups said climbing the sacred rock was insulting. But I think they've given us, if not permission, the ability to do it one last time. And I think. I'm comfortable with them closing it down. It's their property. It's like being on another planet up there. Um, it feels, it definitely feels like humans don't belong up there, I've got to say. The rock contains a rich history of Aboriginal stories of creation. Scaling it is considered to be so offensive that we've been asked not to show anyone making the steep ascent. You know, this is about a spirit, about um, us as Aboriginal people, this is our dreaming, our dream time stories. So, you know, that's why we don't want people to keep continuing to walk up and down these rocks. For years, Aboriginal leaders have urged visitors not to climb the rock. They wouldn't dream of doing so themselves. So today marks the end of a very long campaign. It's all over. Officially, the climb is closed. And at the weekend, there'll be celebrations. Tribal elders say there's an overwhelming sense of relief now that the climb has closed. Uh, the burden will be lifted uh, as of today. I can feel it. Now is the time for the, the climb to have a good rest and heal up. More than 35 people have died on Uluru since the 1950s. Today, a man helped down by rangers was another reminder that the rock can be unforgiving. Despite the dangers and cultural sensitivities, some climbers hope one day to return. I hope they reopen it. I hope the people do reconsider and um, I hope they may, in time, make a clear path for people to enjoy the rock again. 
it's not universally popular. But closing the climb will bring to an end years of distress for Aboriginal people. Phil Mercer, BBC News, Uluru. A reminder of our top story this hour, UK police have arrested a fourth suspect in the deaths of 39 people in a lorry in England. The 48-year-old man from Northern Ireland was detained at Stansted Airport near London. A man and a woman were arrested earlier in northwest England on suspicion of manslaughter and people trafficking. The 25-year-old truck driver remains in custody. A BBC investigation has discovered several of those who died could be Vietnamese. One family member has described receiving distressing text messages. Of course, we'll bring any more developments on that investigation as we get it here on BBC World News. In the meantime, you can reach me and most of the team on Twitter. I'm on there at Ben M. Bland. Thanks for watching.